Living in a university town, whenever I meet somebody new, the first question I'm asked is, so what are you studying? I tell them I'm a traffic engineer. And invariably, the response is something like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> and then the conversation quickly dies. <laughs> My theory on this is that traffic engineers have something in common with divorce lawyers. <laughs> Everyone understands that we're necessary, but they really wish we weren't. So occasionally, the person will try and extend the conversation and engage me about traffic. This doesn't work out too well for me either, because I have the opinion that traffic's a good thing, and that's not very popular. My argument is that every time we get in our car, we're going places and doing things that enrich our lives. We go to work because we have a job. We go to the grocery store because we have money to buy food. We go to the park to play with our kids. Traffic happens because we're busy. Some of that traffic is great. Each individual trip is wonderful. But you put enough of it together, you get congestion, one of the banes of modern existence. As bad as traffic gets, though, I don't think we're going to give up our cars anytime soon. To go with my point, I'd like you to raise your hands, please, and keep them up if you rode in a car to come here today. Anybody 45 or over, put your hand down. And that leaves about half the crowd, and put your hands down as well. So I appreciate you all coming here today, but I ask that you be extra cautious on your way home. You see, that second group of people, they're more likely to die in a car accident than any other way. And those of you 45 or over, don't feel too smug about this. You're not better drivers, you just have other things to worry about. I'm sorry. <laughs> Traffic is caused by people living busy lives, and it's bringing some of those lives to an end. There's a lot of research as to why this is happening, and most of it points to driver inattention as the source of the problem. Your average reaction time is about 1.8 seconds. It varies around that, but in general, it takes about 1.8 seconds, the same amount of time that each of these arrows takes to form. When the ball rolls into the street, or the car in front of you slams on the brakes, it takes you 1.8 seconds to, re to react to it. Here in Blacksburg, football is pretty important. It's a huge social event for the undergrads, and it completely messes up parking for grad students. <laughs> if you're driving at 55 miles an hour, and something happens, it takes you 1.8 seconds before your foot even reaches the brake pedal. Speaking of football, alcohol significantly increases this reaction time, as does talking on the phone and texting while you drive. Fortunately, there's hope. We have a vision of the future where this problem has been overcome. And now we see an enlarged section of 1960s express motorway. Along the ledge of this beautiful precipice, Traffic moves at unreduced rates of speed. Safe distance between cars is maintained by automatic radio control. Curved sides assist the driver in keeping his car within the proper lane under all circumstances. The keynote of this motorway, safety. Safety with increased speed. That video, produced for the 1939 World's Fair, gave us a view of life in the 1960s. The industry currently calls this concept connected vehicles. You can think of it as automated cars that talk to each other. For the past 60 years, at any given time, we've thought we were about 20 years away from realizing it. We still think that, but advances in cell phone and computer technology might be making it a reality. My gut tells me there might be time to wait, and I have three incredibly important reasons to not wait. I'd be remiss if I didn't share pictures of my kids with you here today, and not just because they're so much cuter than I am. <laughs> Jonas can drive in 12 years, but he thinks he might be ready before then. Emily can drive in 14 years, and I might have to issue a public warning when that happens. <laughs> Isaac isn't caring about driving yet, he just wants to eat those leaves, and we won't let him. <laughs> my kids are my life, and I would do anything to keep them safe. That being said, I want them to get their licenses as soon as they can. I'll happily lend them the keys to the car, because I know that driving will enrich their lives. Between me, my kids, and everyone in the audience, we're not going to stop driving just because it's dangerous. We have lives to live, and cars are necessary in our society. 
What we need, I believe, is a Band-Aid to put on the problem until the future arrives. When I first started grad school, Jonas had turned two, and Emily was four months old. It didn't take us long to find the best playground in town, where those last pictures I showed you were taken. At the time, we'd drive from our apartment through this intersection here, but it no longer looks like this. The main intersection in town has been replaced by a roundabout in the last two years. This is a trend that's been increasing in the US, and you can expect it to continue. The first modern roundabout was built in the US in 1995. In 2004, we got the first one in the state of Virginia. By 2008, the state changed their policy to make this the preferred design over a signal. The reason for this is because of conflict. Conflict is simply the opportunity for two cars to hit each other. Traffic begets conflict. There's no escaping it. So traffic engineers tries to control it. We fail at this, and people die. The reason the roundabout's being embraced is because of a reduction from 32 points of conflict down to eight, with a complete removal of the most dangerous crossing conflicts. Accidents still happen at a roundabout, but they mainly just cause property damage, with far less injuries and deaths. In the US, since 1995, we've built about 3,500 roundabouts. Compare that with 25,000 in the United Kingdom and 30,000 in France. Some people believe that the solution is just to build these everywhere. But I have my doubts. There are specific situations where they don't work well, especially on a major road that crosses a minor road. We need other solutions. Alternative intersections enter stage right. These designs reduce conflict to one degree or another. They improve travel on the main road, but at the expense of the side roads. These designs are more expensive than conventional intersections, but far less expensive than interchanges. And when your road gets too busy, this is a good solution instead of going to a highway. I'm going to talk about four designs here today just to give you a taste of what's available. The first alternative, the jug handle design, prohibits left turns at the intersection, forcing drivers to go right in order to go left. I've included signal timing diagrams at the bottom, mainly just for the other traffic engineers in the house. The point of the diagrams is to show that we're reducing the yellow and red time while increasing the amount of time we give to the main movements. The second design today is the median U-turn. This works in a similar way to the jug handle, where they're prohibiting left turns, but in this case, drivers have to go past the intersection and come back around. Both of these designs work really well when you have a lot of through cars with a low number of turning vehicles, so that side street has to be a minor road. You'd build this design over the jug handle if your existing road was already a boulevard or you had a median to work with. The third design today is more unconventional than the last two. This, the displaced left turn crosses left turners over opposing traffic upstream of the main intersection, ending up with five signalized intersections where once there was one. It takes up a lot of space and it costs money, but it's still cheaper than building bridges and overpasses. If you have an existing road that you need to extend its life, you can do this instead of turning it into a highway. The last design today is my favorite of the bunch. The restricted crossing U-turn is a twist on the median U-turn. In this case, the main road can go any which way it wants, but the side streets are all forced to go right. A unique feature of this design is that the signal on either side of the road doesn't have to work together. You can coordinate them separately. When you build them in series, you can then have green light after green light after green light in both directions of travel. It's the dream of every commuter, a light that turns green just for you. <laughs> so why aren't these being built? There's two very good reasons. The first is a general fear based on what traffic engineers call driver expectation. There's a certain percentage of drivers when they encounter a new traffic pattern that will panic. What happens if we build a new design because it's theoretically safer, but then drivers get confused and cause more accidents? The roundabout's been around for, around for a while, and it's still not immune to this problem. This picture was taken <laughs> on the opening day of the intersection I showed you a minute ago. Unfortunately for this driver, the news crew happened to be on site at the time. I'm not sure how they missed the giant arrows on the ground, <laughs> but this is the kind of panic that can happen. <laughs> we can only overcome this issue with education. 
And I think this issue is harder than the other issue we face, being cost. In order to build these intersections, we first have to know how well they're going to work. The videos we saw earlier come from a software program that's very expensive to own and time intensive to use. It's not feasible for consultants who are profit-based to analyze multiple different designs using this software. We have two different options that are available, but they both have problems. The first is the standard software used by traffic engineers. This software allows you to choose between a roundabout or a conventional intersection, but it doesn't go beyond that. You define how many lanes you have coming in, you give it your traffic volumes, and it gives you two measures of functionality. The first is the average delay per vehicle, which is the gold standard in traffic engineering of whether a signal works or not. We use this to determine a grade for the intersection between A and F. In this case, we have an E. The second measure is based on capacity. We look at the total number of cars we're trying to get through the intersection in an hour, and we compare that to the theoretical number of cars that can get through. In this case, we're looking at about 1.05, with numbers above 1 being bad. The second tool we have looks specifically at alternative designs, but only looks at capacity. Because we've been reducing the yellow and red time with these designs, the, capac the theoretical capacity goes up, and all of these intersections are predicted to be doing better. We see here my favorite design, restricted crossing, is the best. Unfortunately, because we're rerouting cars, the delay naturally goes up. And it ends up that you need to use the expensive software in order to figure out which intersection will work better. In the end, consultants will usually just build a larger conventional intersection and call it a day. So where does that leave us? Traffic is caused by people living full lives. And it's bringing some of those lives to an end. Connected vehicles may ultimately solve the problem, but we don't know how long it'll take. I believe we need to start building more of these alternative designs now, but there's some work to be done to make that happen. I've taken this problem on as my own. My first task is to reduce the cost by developing a new analysis method. This is the focus of my research. It's going well, and with any luck, I've predicted how long it'll take better than the connected vehicle people have been predicting. <laughs> my second task is to reduce the fear by spreading the word on these designs. I stood up here today and did just that, so I'm going to go ahead and cross that off my list because that feels great. <laughs> Unfortunately, one talk is not going to shift 100 years of practice. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and make this our task from now on. I encourage you to talk to your family and friends about the crazy engineer who likes traffic and wants us all doing more U-turns. There's no better reason to embrace change than to save lives. Thank you. <laughs>